We start with a delirious, super toxic, southern racist, sexist guy chatting shit on a roof. Having spent hours handcuffed to a small pipe and exposed to the relentless conditions of the onset Taco Bell drug. Hitchy, I mean the Atlanta heat. This male fella then comes back to his senses and realises he's chained up tighter than a naughty skank in a Fifty Shades of Grey book. As suddenly, he finds that all his whinging and whining has brought the dead to his door as he's essentially rung the dinner bell and now they're all hungry for redneck meat. Fortunately, they struggle to get through the padlock chain, barely holding the door shut, but some sneaky ones try to squish themselves through like a mouse to a tiny gap. So naturally, he desperately prays to Jesus like a right cuck, before spotting a selection of tools that the clumsy chocolate geezer tripped over at the end of the last Debbie and then hilariously tells Jesus to F off and that he don't want no stinking help anyway, because he can totally use his belt to lasso over that hacksaw thing. Anyway, after the opening titles, Shane is chatting to little Carl and getting far too comfy worming his way into becoming his fake daddy. He says he's going to teach him all the manly things that his real dad didn't get a chance to, like catching frogs in a small pond and shaving his pubes into funny shapes once they start sprouting. <laughs> or some shit. And hilariously, Carl's getting quite a decent haircut from his mummy. Though I guess she never taught him how to do it himself. And that's why he let his giant mane grow all over his face and into a giant mullet for the next seven seasons after she totally pegs it, giving birth to his half-sister in a small prison. <laughs> Whoops, spoilers. Although those eppies are over ten years old at this point. Suddenly though, a thundering siren echoes around the hills and a speeding red sports car comes zooming down the lane. And that Asian and Glenn fella from the last ep, he gets out all giddy, before Shane yells for him to pop the hood whilst Amy hysterically asks if her sister is okay. And Dale then tells him he's a right Mogadon for driving up here ringing the dinner bell by not knowing how to turn off the car alarm. But said Glenn fella is just ecstatic about finally getting to ride in the car of his dreams, what he could only afford after the financial system collapsed and a corrupt deputy sheriff totally hotwired and stole it for him. Anyway... The rest of the gang soon arrive and Andrew reunites with her annoying sister. Whilst Rick stumbles out, still looking like a Gen Z TikToker and seemingly all nervous about meeting new people IRL. Well, that is until he clocks a little scrote across the way, who looks suspiciously like his own little scrote what he's been looking for all this time. And turns out it is his little scrote and his wife is totally alive too. So they have a sweet reunion, though Laurie can't seem to believe her eyes that her dead husband is now alive and not trying to eat her brains and probably feeling slightly bittersweet given she can't really go shag that Shane fella in the woods in front of her wedding ring anymore. And Shane is equally disappointed that he now ain't going to get to tap that ass every lunchtime in the middle of a mushroom field. <laughs> anyway, that evening, Rick tells him how he felt waking up in a filthy hospital where all the staff were nowhere to be seen, which again just seems to be a standard day in an NHS ward to be fair. <laughs> Apparently, the doctors told Laurie that they were going to medevac the patients over to Atlanta by air, but it never happened, bro. And Shane looks proper guilt-ridden for some strange reason. And not just because he's literally been keeping his wife warm whilst he's been gone. LOL! Though, turns out Rick is totally fine with his whole family abandoning him, and thanks his buddy Shane for looking after them regardless. And boy, did Shane look after his wife well. Anyway, just behind them, some ignorant trailer trash bloke called Ed makes a larger fire, which is in contravention of strict rules of the camp to keep said fires low so they can't be seen from a distance. So Shane goes over to smack a bitch up, but neither man really wants to get into a Barney in front of his anxious family. So this Ed guy tells his timid wife to put out the fire for him like his personal servant. And Shane takes a moment to ask how they are and show him a little kindness in front of their abusive husband and father. And turns out this is our first glimpse of that carol bird, who seems to get emotionally stronger and more badass with the more hair she grows. Itchy! I mean as the seasons go on. And her little daughter Sophia just nods and keeps her head down in fear. The group then talk about how to broach the subject of telling Mel's hot-headed brother that they totally left his bro chained up to a small pipe on top of a roof in the middle of a scorch in Atlanta summer, and in a building truck full of murderous cannibals. Naturally, they reckon he shan't be too pleased about that, and so Amy and Dale suggest doing that lying thing to totally take the heat off. But Andrea and T-Dog say, nah bro, we'll just tell the truth, as honesty is the best policy in she. 
And also, he's likely still alive, because I totally chained up the door before I totally cucked and run off like a little bitch. And so Dixon is still up there and probably still whinging about it to this day. After telling his son Carl that he loves him, despite mispronouncing his name as Coral and then porking his long lost wifey bird, Rick gets up the next morning and thanks that timid Carol lass what must have mug written on her forehead for washing and ironing his clobber whilst he was asleep. Hilariously, Glenn with two ends just watches as his beloved new motor gets ripped apart by the camp scavengers, and not unlike how all his friends and family also got ripped apart for that time by cannibal scavengers. Anyway, Rick tells Laurie that he struggled to sleep because he had dreams about a kinky bloke in handcuffs, and can't stop thinking about that super toxic southern racist sexist guy still locked up on an abandoned roof, but she just says he needs to get out more because his fantasies are well fucked up, bro. Achoo. I mean, that's totally crazy thinking about going back to that place just to save a literal white supremacist from a locked up roof. And before he can say, white supremacist lives matter, babe, the air is filled with the terrified cries of his little scrope Carl, who's found a dead guy eating a raw deer full of arrows in the woods. So naturally, they all gangbang it to death before a filthy bloke called Daryl Dixon appears and is totally bummed about somehow being beaten to his own kill by a brain-dead shuffling zombie that walks at a snail's pace. Dale then says that that's the first one they've seen up in the mountains and reckons it might be because they're running out of food in the city. Anyway, this Daryl feather seems like quite an aggressive chap and has a pretty rotten tooth to boot. Especially evident when he tries to smack them all up after they tell him they left his relative up on a roof when he tried to steal an election at gunpoint. <sighs> Some shit. But T-Dog then admits what happened and how he's such a klutz that he dropped the key down a small drain. But it's totally cool, mate, because he chained up the door to prevent his brother becoming a beefy five layers, so it's all totally good, bro. Naturally, Daryl is determined to retrieve his super toxic racist sexist sibling, and Richard says, good idea, mate, because I can't fucking sleep, so I'll take you back there personally, and she. Laurie is super pissed, though, and as is Shane, because they just can't believe he'd risk his life for a literal white supremacist what loves a bit of racialisms. But Rick just says he's a total pussy owl and can't just leave a nasty old man up on a roof in the middle of summer because he might suffer a little sunburn and get all sore and she. So a guilt-ridden T-Dog steps up to help him. And Glenn with two ends is also roped into the cockamimi scheme given how much he brags about being able to get in and out of places quick and clean. Shane, however, totally protests because they need all the men here in case any more of them zombozos wander up the mountain looking for more raw deer. But Rick says he's totally brought and dropped a bag full of shooters back in the city, which they could all really do with right about now. Naturally, his family don't want him to go. But Rick says he also made a plan with that Morgan fella back in the first Ebby, and he has to warn them to not go to Atlanta. And to do that, he's got to go get the walkie-talkie thing from that bag of guns to give them the heads up, and warn them not to walk into the same trap that he did. You know, the genius idea to casually wander into an overpopulated urban city during a zombie outbreak because you have zero common sense. Later, T-Doggy Dog and that Rick fella then make a deal with Dale for his bolt cutters, in return for retrieving the rest of Dale's tools which they left up on the roof with Merle. Before they head off though, Shane gives him the rest of their ammo supply which consists of the sum of four rounds, which should see them well in an urban environment populated with just under 500,000 zombified peeps. So the gang drive off and then walk the rest of the way, while Shane bonds with his best friend Seed by teaching him to catch some frogs in a small creek, whilst the women just sit and watch the lads have bundles of fun, and wonder why the heck they're stuck washing all their kecks and immediately falling back into stereotypical gender roles in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, despite being stunning and brave 21st century feminists. Oh! Anyway, after discussing what comforts they miss about modern life, including their vibrators, Carol's husband Ed comes down to the riverbank to investigate the source of the laughing because he's totally uncomfortable with a bunch of fannies enjoying themselves. Laurie then tells Carl to get his ass back to camp before warning Shane that their post-apocalyptic tryst is over now her hubby has gone full Lazarus and seemingly come back from the dead and she. And turns out she's totally bitter because Shane told her that her husband died and that's presumably the real reason why he was looking proper guilty earlier in the epi. Meanwhile, Ed gets all toxically masculine and soon makes the lady super uncomfortable just loitering around and watching over them whilst watching his undies. So clocking Shane holding a giant fuck off shotgun wandering nearby, Andrea bravely finds her balls and stands up to him. And the girls soon all call Ed out for beating his wife 
whilst Carol then tries to go with him just to keep the peace. But he ends up going full Chris Brown and slapping poor Kaz in the face. So Shane takes all his repressed rage at not getting to shag his best friend's wife anymore nor teaching his boy how to catch frogs out on its face and proceeds to beat him to within an inch of his life whilst poor cucked Carol just snivels over her mushed up hubby. Elsewhere, the rescue group then cut through to the roof but find Merle has seemingly been evaporated by the Atlantean heat and leaving behind only a frazzled sawn off hand in his place. And that's it. That's episode three. Though, not sure why Rick promised to tell his family all about that Wayne fella whose guts he smeared over everyone in episode two, but then never even mentioned it when he finally reunited with said family in this epi. I mean, the corrupt deputy sheriff who goes around nicking dead girl's bikes, squatting in his mate's gaff and shooting children between the eyes, can't be a dishonest liar as well, can he? Surely not. Huh. Well, maybe he'll tell them all about this Wayne chap in the next set of epis. But anyway, on to episode four. We start with a sequel to Naughty's classic, Two Girls, One Cup. And here, it's more like two birds and one canoe. As these blonde sister broads talk about how their dad taught them all different things. Because they were born 12 years apart and he was a master troll. <gasps> was that she? Whilst up in the hills, creepy Jim digs some graves in 40 degree heat. And despite no one being dead, because reasons. Anyway, after the opening titles, we catch back up with Rick and the crew who have come across a severed hand whilst out looking for that super sexist, toxic southern racist guy, aka Daryl's brother Merle. Naturally, Dazza loses his shit upon realising his brother had to maim himself just to escape a kinky rooftop bonding session after presumably forgetting his safe word, till Rick tells him to cool it bro, or else he'll totally shoot this pussy old redneck in the back of his red neck. So Daryl retrieves the thing and deduces that his brother used a tourniquet to patch himself up and totally escaped whilst T-Dog then picks up Dale's tools, and this time making sure not to trip over him like a right numpty. As Daryl follows the blood trail over to another door on the roof, which is conveniently sprung up out of nowhere. Um, what? Meanwhile, back at camp, Dale comes across that creepy gym fella still digging graves for some creepy reason, whilst Daryl then kills a zombie woman cosplaying as a budget Davy Jones, as a group make their way down through the building following Mel's trail who was seemingly taken out a few walkers, literally single-handedly. Nice. Elsewhere, Andrew and Amy bring home the bacon. Well, a heap of fish, but you get my drift. Before Dale goes for Buzz Killington and says he's super worried about that creepy Jim fellow who keeps digging empty graves in a perfectly good field in the peak of summer. Anyway, over in Atlanta, Daryl finds an iron with fleshy gristle stuck to it and says Merle must have cauterized his stump like a total badass before realising he's done an Elvis and left the building, and is now likely wandering out in the street like a half-dazed crazy person. Naturally, Daryl wants to rush out like a madman to find him, so Rick gives him a little shove and says, call your jets, Daz, and let us make a plan where we don't all end up as zombie jail son, because they first need to get the guns and she. Back at camp, the group confront that creepy Jim fella what loves cosplaying as a gravedigger, and Shane tells him to stop making six foot human sized holes in the ground because you're totally scaring the kiddies, my guy. But he just won't stop. So Shane totally tackles him and confiscates his shovel, where Jim then cries into the mud about how the dead fella's totally ripped his wife and kid out of his arms and the only reason he got away and lived is because the dead were too busy munching up his family. And before he can say, that's the darkest shit since whatever dropped into my bog bowl last night, we cut back to the Atlanta crew who are busy coming up with a totally convoluted plan, which ultimately amounts to Glenn running over and picking up the gun bag. So, after revealing some pointless backstory about how he used to deliver pizzas, said Glenn fella enacts his master plan, and proceeds to run over to the bag of guns and totally picks it up. Wowzers! Talk about giving Ethan Hunt a run for his money! When suddenly... Daryl is jumped by some gangbanger who won't stop shouting and essentially ringing the dinner bell. So Dazza smacks him up good and proper before getting jumped by two more of his buddies, who then kidnap a bemused Glenn who's now randomly appeared. But not before Daryl shoots one of them in the arse cheek because comedy, bro. Rick and T-Doggy Dog then rush over and ask Dazza what the heck happened because he had one fucking job, son. Meanwhile, back at camp, Shane pours a bucket of water over that creepy Jim fellow who they've now tied up to a tree. 
and he then apologises to the group and the kids because he must have got sunstroke and shit. And that's why he was digging a bunch of family sized graves in 40 degree heat. And also because he had a dream last night about little Carl who was totally worried about his dad. But he can't remember the rest. And before you can say, some are better called Childline given they caught a creepy grave digger who dreams of anxious little boys. We cut back to the Atlanta crew who are interrogating the young punk ass gangbanger they captured. This Rudy Fleet then gets all leery and totally mocks Mel's name till Daryl takes out his bro's severed hand and tells him that the last guy who made fun of his relative got his wanking hand chopped off. No way! So, terrified and desperate to keep his baiting tool, this chap totally cucks out and leads him right to his boss's HQ. Turns out the gangster's called Guermo and he tells them that they totally took that bag of guns that they were eyeing up in the street and so wants them to come back with the heat and then they could have that Asian fella back with the two ends in his name. So they soon regroup to consider their options. And naturally, Rick is determined to get Glenn back. But T Doggy Dog reckons that they can't really rely on the word of a random crooked gangster to deliver on their bargain. And as Daryl thinks guns are worth more than gold in this new world economy, he asks Ricky Boy if that Asian chap is really worth his life or that bag of shooters. And Rick just says, Yeah, bro, because he totally saved me from a stationary tank, so now I owe him a life debt and she. So also naturally, he plans to go back in there and shoot up the gaff. And after they indeed go back to the gangster's HQ, they all promptly get into a Mexican standoff. And I seriously have to wonder what on earth the plan is here, because just like earlier, Rick and his three mates are vastly outnumbered. But before the writers are forced to address just how thunderously dumb Rick is and write themselves out of this ludicrous corner, one of the vicious gangster's granny stumbles out and says some old fella is having an asthma attack. And Rick is just left baffled whilst vicious gangster Guermo goes bright red at being humiliated and undermined by doddery old Fanny whilst out here doing his vicious gangstery stuff. Anyway, she pleads with a local sheriff not to arrest her grandson and his little friends because he's totally a good boy what didn't do nothing. So Rick just says chill bro because he's just helping us find a missing person called Glenn with two N's in his name. And she says she totally knows an Asian fella by that name and spelling and proceeds to take him straight to him. Because in a shocking twist, what no one could ever see coming. Turns out the grimy HQ was just a front for an old folks home they're protecting. And the Fisher's gangsters are all ex-nurses and caregivers with hearts of gold. Who totally stay to look after all the coughing dodgers, given most of the other staff fucked off when all the bad shit went down. Rick then takes Guermo aside and says, why didn't you just tell me you were a goodie who just wanted to take care of a bunch of old wrinklies? Because I almost shot you all up worse than an emo kid at a high school. And he says he couldn't risk just being honest when so many people try to take their resources when they have old folk to feed and protect and wipe up after. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I'm a little lost, but fair enough. So because Rick is a bleeding heart liberal, he gives them a few of their shooters to help them out. And presumably, so they can go threaten more random innocent people in the streets who are just trying to scavenge scraps whilst cosplaying as vicious gangsters. Oh! As Guillermo warns them all to be careful, because the weak totally get eaten, bro. Which feels like it's ominously foreshadowing something, to be fair. But anyway, on the walk back to their van, they soon realise it's totally gone, and just assume it was Merle what totally nicked it, even though it could have literally been anyone, including some of them vicious cosplaying gangsters and shit. But they somehow conclude it was that Merle fella, and he's totally going to be taking some intense vengeance back to the camp. So they better nut up and get back up there pronto. And back at said camp, Andrew is rummaging around in Dale's drawers. Steady. As she's looking for something to wrap up a birthday gift. Because it's totally her sister's special day tomorrow. Which doesn't really bode well for a person's lifespan whenever something like that is casually mentioned in the horror genre. Oh shit, not good. But he says leave it with him and he'll find something to wrap it up with. Which is exactly what I said to Madame Fang Fang at the local pleasure house last night after I ran out of condoms. Anyway, Shane unties Jim from the tree as Carol tries to get her abusive husband to come eat her fish supper. Ooh, steady. But he's too humiliated to go out and face those women what stood up to him and watched him get his ass handed to him by a psycho copper who was pissed off that he can't now keep doing his naughty affair thing. The Atlanta crew then run all the way back up the mountain whilst the camp enjoys their fishy dinner. And hilariously, Dale's story about why he keeps winding his watch in an apocalypse and quoting Faulkner rather badly falls flatter than Prince Elrond's face. And it's so cringy it makes Amy have to run off to the toilet. 
Meanwhile, a literal and figuratively bruised Ed tells a bunch of shadows to leave him alone already, before getting himself munched up by a surprise visit from the dead folk. And because Amy's too busy moaning about the lack of toilet paper, she also gets herself munched up. Not a joke. And suddenly, all hell breaks loose, and pretty literally, as the dead soon descend upon the earth and also upon nameless extras. And just like said extras, the camp is then totally torn apart. And also like Amy. Damn! Naturally, Andrea runs over to her dopey sibling who cared more about the lack of hygiene products in an apocalypse and situational awareness skills, whilst Rick and the crew finally rejoin the main camp, and just in the nick of time to put their newfound bag of guns to good use and totally take out the walkers as the weak literally get eaten. Whilst Andrea just sobs over her dying sis and says she don't really know what to do. So instead of applying basic pressure to the wound or even taking the last few moments to say I love you, she just stares gormlessly at her suffering sister and totally watches her die. Nice. And we end with that creepy gym fella mysteriously saying that he totally remembers his dream now and why he dug all them holes. And the show just cuts to black before you can say, wait, so we're just skipping over the fact that clairvoyance is a thing in this universe now? Because that ability could totally come in handy when predicting the next walker attack. And that's it. That's the Abbey. But man, what a bummer that Andrew's little sis totally pegged it the night before her birthday. And just before she could give her the present, what well, Dale presumably spent all afternoon wrapping in leaves and she... But anyway, that's a blot and that's a lot. Considering that bell thing, so you don't miss episodes 5 and 6 when they drop. Say hello in the comments if you have time. And I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>